open the roof at a certain time, it knows when sundown is, open the roof, start taking flats against the sky at exactly the right, uh, you know, it'll find the right exposure based on where the sky is. Um, and then after the flats, go to multiple targets all night long, shoot every single filter, refocus in between filters, and then save all the files into different folders for me so that when I wake up, everything is sitting there in the Dropbox. Like that's, that's how far you can take automation. And honestly, even beyond that. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. In this episode, Dustin and I sit down and we discuss the topic of automation, how to set up a system that requires almost no attention from you whatsoever. So let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Space Junk, a weekly podcast dedicated to the amazing hobby of amateur astronomy. Each week, we'll bring you interesting and fun discussions with an eye towards providing you with the latest information and advice on the tools, gadgets, software, and techniques for maximizing your enjoyment of the night sky. Your hosts are Tony Darnell from DeepAstronomy.Space and Dustin Gibson from OPT Telescopes, a world leader in telescopes and accessories. Hey, Dustin, it's good to have you back. We are here tonight. We are gathered here today. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, man, has there ever been a normal start to one no, of these podcasts? Uh, not when I hit record, man. We just oh. go. <laughs> you know, we can talk for 15 minutes before you hit that button. And as soon as, as, soon as you hit that button, you get weird with it. We are, ga- we are, we are gathered, gathered here, today here today. To discuss. Oh, man. Okay. To, we right. are gathered here today to discuss automation in astronomy. How you can automate your life. The under the stars. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Perfect. I don't know how it gets better than that. So yeah, we're we're talking about automation, and yeah. I feel like this is a touchy subject. It's kind of along oh, yeah, the why? lines. Um, have you ever heard someone? Actually, I know, I know the answer to this. I don't even know why I'm asking, but someone say, <laughs> "Uh, hey, you shouldn't get a go-to telescope because that's cheating for your first telescope. You have to get a telescope with no motors." that you have to learn the night sky or yeah. else you're cheating, you know, and they get like offended by it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I know. Yep. Yep. I've heard of that for sure. But we're, yeah, it's a and, little bit more than that. We're not talking just about go-tos, although go-to telescopes are an integral part, can be. Well, that's one of the first of steps in automation, right? Yeah. You're automating true. that part of the process. Um, and true automation, I mean, it gets to the point where like our observatories, I can set it up for a week from now to open the roof at a certain time. It knows when sundown is. Open the roof, start taking flats against the sky at exactly the right, uh, you know, it'll find the right exposure based on where the sky is. Um, And then after the flats, go to multiple targets all night long, shoot every single filter, refocus in between filters, and then save all the files into different folders for me so that when I wake up, everything is sitting there in the Dropbox. Like that's that's how far you can take automation and honestly even beyond that but um you know this thing you can take it as far as you want but the question ultimately then is at what point do you take automation so far that you're you know you've you've modified the hobby to a point where it's like a different hobby altogether (laughs) (laughs) yeah you're you're into robotics now or something else entirely exactly yeah yeah you're not even part of the process anymore And, and that's one of the questions i get asked all the time on instagram is like do because I do it both ways. I love setting up. You know, when you were here, we set up telescopes in the front yard. That's my favorite thing to do still today. Um, I love being part of it and setting up and polar aligning and like the whole thing. Um, but damn, the convenience is nice with automation to just, especially when you're tired or you've had a long day. I mean, logging in and just hitting the button and saying, I want to shoot the Horsehead Nebula tonight. Please do this for me while I sleep. And then going to bed and knowing it's safe and it's all covered. And if it rains, it's going to close itself and all of that. Like, that's pretty amazing, too. But there's like, like there's different steps toward that goal in automation. Yeah. And that's kind of what we're talking about today. Yeah, that's a really good point. There's different levels of automation we're talking about. And for me, I think the level one of automation would be something that just takes some of the pain in the butt stuff that we always see and, in, 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 you know, setting up a telescope away, like polar aligning or having it set up on a pier somewhere in your backyard, maybe covered by uh, a waterproof uh, enclosure of some kind, but you take that, that automatic or that enclosure off, push a few buttons and you're observing. That's a good level of automation. It takes out a lot of the sort of the busy work of getting ready for a night, uh, a night's observing run. So yeah, uh, 
you know, so that would, so let's start with that level of automation. Just, just taking out the, the bait, the, the pain in the butt stuff, polar aligning, mm-hmm. uh, 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 setting the date and time, getting your camera set up. What, what would be some of the equipment that would let you do that just to go out and set up and start observing? So first off, I think we should clarify that when we're talking about automation, we're really talking about imaging because you can't really automate a visual experience. Although, <laughs> oh, that, No, by definition, that's a good point. you got to get yeah. your butt out there to the telescope. That's yeah, not automatic. It's hard to be like, all right, take my eyeball and put it up there at you know, midnight. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like, it's hard point. to it's hard to automate that. Although I think the Stellina and even probably more so the Unistellar are getting pretty close to automating the visual experience even because I mean it's still digital it, you know it shows up on your phone but it's more like a visual experience because it's just live mm-hmm. um so but I, I to not make this too complicated like we're just talking about imaging is yeah. really what I'm trying to say yeah and automating imaging uh yeah I mean I guess like where most people start that automation process is with focusing and for good reason they get an automated focuser right um and I think the reason is because especially as scopes get faster and faster, the um, basically the focal point where that light, that cone, the light cone where it comes to focus gets steeper and steeper with faster telescopes. And so you have no room for error there. Like you look at scopes like, like let's take an extreme example, the Celestron Rasa. It's an F2 system. Think about how steep the light cone is on F2. You know, I mean, it's like... <laughs> they're they're coming in so sharp that as light comes to a point and connects that's your focal point but then obviously light keeps going past that and then if you're not exactly where that critical focus is then you've technically missed focus and so it's really hard for you to do that visually because you've got the atmosphere against you and so you know in your mind you can only see what you see and although you can see it live and it's like hey the star looks sharp there a fraction of a second later it looks blurry because the atmosphere dis- atmospheric disturbances so it's hard for you to mathematically calculate in your mind here's where it was sharp this many seconds here's where it wasn't for this many seconds and try to find that middle to find focus whereas an automated focuser a motorized focuser that you can connect to your telescope and just run it through software it's going to do what's called a V-curve, where it takes you know, out-of-focus measurements on both sides of focus and then says, you know, here's where it was exactly this much out of focus on this side. Here's where it was exactly the same amount of out-of-focus on this side at multiple points. And then it can average it. So it doesn't care where it got the sharpest star. It cares where it got the best average across multiple, multiple focus points, which eliminates that atmospheric problem. But it's a math equation, not just a visual experience. And it's always going to be sharper than what you get visually, you know, for for long exposures. Um, so that's the first one that people do just because it makes life easy. Yeah, it does take a lot of the, the setup strain out of it. Um, so uh, and also, I think that goes what what goes with this is you pretty much were assuming this is going to have some kind of go to telescope mounted uh yeah. system right with go-to system is almost mm-hmm. it, for an automated setup you're going to need to have to start with that kind of mount these would be mounts yeah. that can be as simple as something on a next star system all the way up to you know uh, plane wave level instrumentation but you do need a way to automate you know if all you want to do is turn on your telescope and start observing then you'll need some kind of go-to system to go along with that. Um, so and that almost, coupled with almost the, the all, focuser. Almost all tracking mounts anymore are go-to, with the popular exceptions being like the the Skywatcher Star Adventurer yeah. or the Ioptron Sky Guider that are used mainly for wide field photography. But just about all, you know, larger capacity, I'm saying larger capacity, you know, the 20 pounds and up kind of stuff. If it's tracking, which you would need for photography anyway, it's also go to. So yeah. most people have a go to mount. That's true. In this day and age, that's that's definitely the the, the case. Um, yeah. So so let's talk about some some um, focuser ideas. Then what 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 do you look at some of the better focusers that are out there? Uh, so you know. ZWO, the ZWO uh, EAF is a very, very popular one because people like to combine it with tools like the ASI Air Pro 
um, from ZWO, which is, you know, the, the box that's going to run the software. Obviously, if you're going to use these focusing mechanisms, you have to have some kind of software to control it. Um, but you're going to have that anyway for your camera, for your auto guider. You're going to be running software, period, um, for the most part. So I would say, you know, ZWO is uh, in a very inexpensive option that people choose a lot because it's also very easy to connect. It's widely universal. Um, and it really depends on the scope. You know, different scopes have different focusers that kind of go along with them. For instance, like the Radian Raptor, um, the one that, that we developed it. We have a specific focuser produced by Optech, who, you know, in my opinion, makes some of the best stuff in the world. That Optech, just about everything they produce. And actually, I can't think of anything they produce that off the top of my head that that isn't world-class quality. Um those focusers, you know, they're going to have higher resolution, but they come at a, a higher price tag as well. But then you'll be able to find even more critical focus. You'll be able to find an exact focus with something like that. But there are a ton of different focusers out there that, you know, can do this job. But I'd say that, you know, the really popular ones are generally, you know, the ZWO, um, the Focus Cube, and, you know, you've got like the, the Optech stuff and then on, have on and on from there. Do you have a rough idea of the price range of those? Um, what they would what they would sell for? Uh, yeah, you know they they start at you know a uh, hundred bucks plus. You know they they don't have to get super expensive. I think the ZWO we can pull it up here. Um, I don't have that one off the top of my head, but I know that ours is like four ninety nine for the Raptor. Mm -hmm. But then again, like I said, I mean that's like if you really want to just have the one and done um, solution. Yeah, so the ZWO is one ninety nine, so two hundred bucks for the focusing solution, and then the Radian one is four ninety nine. So in between there, you can get the type that connect to the focuser on your telescope that are going to give you really, really precise focus. That's at the push of a button instead of trying to manually, you know, throw a Batnov mask on the front and then try to manually see like, well, is that perfect? Because then you always have that doubt. You know, like digital cameras have taken away that doubt. Yeah. Think about your Canon or whatever you have. You push the button down a little bit and it just pops into perfect crisp focus. And it removes the doubt that you're out of focus. But when you're doing it manually, there's always a little bit of doubt in your head. Like, did I really achieve perfect focus? Yeah, it, it takes the art out of it because it used to be an art. There used to be an art to focusing. You would sit there <clears throat> and I was lucky enough back in my observing days to have a motorized focuser but all it had was these two buttons that i would push to have it go back and forth it was a highly machine uh, uh focuser but and i had a little digital number the number meant nothing it just was some number away from zero that i could focus to and i would sit there with my eye in the eyepiece and go past that cone you were talking about that v that v mm -hmm. cone on either side of the focus and then it would be still my brain deciding well that looks like a pretty small star circle so i'll just stop there um and leave it but even then you know i, I was always the sense of i don't know if i've got it exact and certainly it would shift over the course of a night and that's another thing i wanted to ask you so as the night progresses the flexure and all this stuff on a telescope changes the temperature changes do these automated focusers compensate for that too or do you have to periodically just go back and say reset focus yeah, the uh, the top focusers do. So you'll see that they um, they say like TCF next to them. So it's temperature compensating focuser, and you can save different points. So at you know at this temperature swing, we know that focus shifts inward by X, right? And you can save all of that into your software. And the Optech stuff. That's another another reason that we went with Optech for the Radian focuser was that they make that extremely easy to do. Good. And so, um, you know, all of those things in their their programs are very simple. But yeah, you just literally save it, and whenever the temperature swings, it knows because it's checking the temperature all the time. It knows, hey, I should probably, uh, you know, drop the focus down, and it can do it as the you know through the throughout the imaging run and make sure that while you're sleeping or whatever you're doing, I mean, you stayed sharp, even though as temperature changes, you know, scopes change shape they change um you know in length and uh it's drastic you can see to where you start the night in perfect focus and then as it gets colder and you know that scope uh contracts it changes drastically because the elements are now what closer together i guess it would be and uh your focus has changed you could be completely out of focus by the end of the night so it's important to think about that stuff
But even though if we're talking when you say about uh, when you were talking about the problem with fast focusers like the uh, Rasa telescope, they have a steep light cur- cone, yes, to get down to the to the image plane, but they're also very wide field. Would you still see much of a shift in focus through the night in a fast instrument, or 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 would or would it? Yeah, be- so they're wide field, but that cone being so steep, you have less error or room for error. So they're more sensitive. So it, they're more sensitive, exactly. And you have to think it's a closed system. Um, closed system. So if you think about something like um, a reflector that just doesn't have a corrector plate, it, it's not a closed system like a refractor. The air inside the refractor is trapped. And so it takes a while for it to come to ambient temperature. And so you're having those changes through for longer periods throughout the night as the temperature swings. Whereas an open system, like my plane wave, you know, it's not a closed tube. There's nothing in the front. It's just wide open to the air. Um, the only thing it's trying to cool is that mirror in the back. And they do a good job. You know, most of the big reflector companies do a good job of making sure those things can reach and stay at ambient temperature throughout the night. And um, open tube systems adjust very quickly. And then they use tricks like, you know, carbon fiber development uh, of the scopes and stuff like that. Yeah, too. they have a lot less uh, temperature sensitivity to those yeah, carbon fiber exactly. tubes. Yeah, exactly. They're thermally stable. So... You don't have that problem. But truthfully, you don't even have to worry about temperature compensation if you have good software because you can just say, you know what? Focusing only takes 30 seconds and it's automated anyway. So just set, there's usually a box in there that says focus between certain number of exposures. So like mine, for instance, it refocuses every 30 minutes. So I don't even set the temperature. I just say, no matter what the temperature is, just run a focusing run every 30 minutes and make sure that you're in perfect focus. Okay, well, let's go. I want to. I definitely want to talk about software and computers in just a minute. But before I do, I want to. So I want to just mention that. So to get started, we would we would need a halfway decent go to mount to set this up, a good focuser, a, an imager, a camera of some sort, and just to get you started with some basic automation stuff. How important do you think it is to have this stuff permanently mounted? Um. I don't think it's really so. So yeah, I mean, for automation, how important yeah. is it? To yeah, how it? important do you think it would be I, to have something like maybe just appear in your backyard where you have this always set up? Do you think that's important think it, or not? No, I think that systems are getting more and more complete. Like, let's take Prima Luce for instance, right? They make they make something called the Isato focuser, which is another one we should mention in that group mm-hmm. because it's a very very high end high resolution focuser. It pairs perfectly, just like ZWO does with their ASI Air. The Asato uh, pairs with the uh, Prima Luce Eagle, which, I mean, basically everything. It's kind of an unfair comparison because everything pairs with the Eagle. It, uh, you know, is a a PC. It's a a Windows machine, so it can run anything with ASCOM. But let's say that you have an Eagle plugged up with your Asato, plugged up with um, your dew heaters. Everything is controlled then you're literally leaving that on your telescope all the time. So now that permanent system, the benefit used to be that you don't have to unplug everything and tear it down and reset it up every time and try to achieve that. You're bringing the software contained in that computer inside the Eagle all the time. All of your settings are saved to where it's going to automatically check dew point. It's going to turn your dew heaters on when needed. That's without you ever changing anything, no no matter where you are. Um, you know, it has GPS, you know, it has all these things, these new ones do, um, you've got all of these advantages that are contained within the system. So you're, you're bringing your observatory with you everywhere you go. So that automation stays, even if you move, um, you know, it's all hooked up all the time. So it's like the benefits that used to exist only for observatories. Now, even it doesn't matter if you're shooting in Texas one day in California, the next your system's the same because you didn't take everything apart. It's all contained within that that box, that eagle, and it stays connected to everything because it's all it's a portable unit. So, no, I don't think it's important anymore to to have it only set up this way for permanent setups. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, and, and I want to talk more about this eagle here in just a minute. But the the <laughs> this idea of you know if you don't have an eagle you've got something else like a laptop okay with all of its attendant usb cables and all these other things that are that are you're going to have to schlep around in that case you would most definitely want to have some sort of shed or something in your backyard so that you're not fussing with that every day especially if you want to observe Mm. on a nightly basis so it becomes more necessary or at least more desirable to have a spot where all of this is set up if you don't have 
one of these kind of computers because a computer is the next thing. That's that is something that's required if you're going to have some kind of automation. In addition to go to focusing and imagers, you're going to need some kind of way to control and run the software, which we'll get to, I think, after this part. But computers, they can be as simple as your laptop with any kind of laptop you might own. I've even heard people using Chromebooks, although I don't know what sort of software they ran. But they, you can't, you need something, some CPU system to integrate all of these components via software. Now, you, let's talk, let's go ahead. The best thing for this is the Eagle, which you were talking about. Let's dive into that just a little bit more. What is the Eagle? We've had hangouts on or uh, podcasts on this before, but let's just briefly mention what the Eagle is. Yeah, I I absolutely love that product. I feel like if you don't have an eagle, you will. <laughs> you will. You you know, I I resisted it for a long time because it's Windows and I've I've pretty openly talked about it on the uh the Twitch streams even with you about mm -hmm. how my passion for um hating on Windows. I I just <laughs> We all do. It's it's yeah. my favorite pastime too. Yeah, it, <laughs> Windows is so terrible. Anybody who's gone through an update <laughs> of Windows knows what we're talking about. Can I please have my computer back, please? No, you got to wait a week yeah. for this update to finish. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, but, you know, I so I hesitated. I I didn't get an Eagle for a long time. I knew they had a lot of advantages. It's basically, I mean, think about it. It's a tiny box that you can literally use as like a dovetail. It mount, you can mount your telescope on it and then never take your computer off your system. So it just stays with your system all the time. Yeah. When you take your telescope down, your computer is on your telescope. It's small and you never take it down and it powers all your equipment and, you know, it's Wi-Fi. So you can turn your monitor into your cell phone if you want and run your whole system from your cell phone or your iPad or whatever. And, um, you know, it's like, and it runs your dew heaters and everything. And so I finally made the switch. I started with one of my observatories and after using it the first time, I, you know, I, I called Tom, Tom Bramwell here, and it's like, yeah, all of my systems are switching. Everything, I'm getting away from my Mac stuff, and I'm going to stop fighting against it. I'm going to get Ascom, and I'm going to run everything off the Eagles. And now, literally, all my systems are run off Eagles. Um, and my personal rig, I've got an Eagle sitting, you know, 15 feet from here, where any personal rig that I bring out, I uh, I just throw that on the dovetail and go. You just mount it to, like, the rings or, you know, your top dovetail, wherever you want it. And go and your computer, you've already got all the software, everything on there, and it can run anything. So you just you just grab the whole system and go. You don't have to think about like, oh, did I grab my laptop? Did I grab my charger? Did you know, is the laptop gonna get messed up out there? Like this is just a metal box that's safe in the elements. And you don't have to think about it. And that's really what some of this equipment should do is just get out of the way. And I love the Eagle for that. It really, really simplifies astronomy. Yeah, um, I, I, I want to talk, I'm going to cut this part out. I want to talk about what it costs, so I'm looking it up real quick. Do you happen to know offhand what these, what, what this, I'm going to cut this part out. I just, uh, let me just see Prima Luce. Okay, so I get it now. Okay, so yeah, th this this idea of having some kind of computing power with you is essential for automation. We talk, you can use your laptop, yes, but here is a, a computer that is built with amateur astronomy in mind from the beginning. And as Dustin says, you can just mount, mount it onto your telescope and yeah. be forget about it right you've got usb cables you've got everything that 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 an imaging telescope needs to have power wi-fi uh and usb all of the things that let it communicate to each other back and forth and and uh you're looking at a couple grand for something like this for the very to very top end yeah. so they start at like 299 300 bucks and that's for the eagle core if you're just going to run a dslr and like a guider they start at 300 bucks Okay. Um, and then in Eagle three, you can still get for like 800. So that's a, I mean, that is a full PC that can power all your equipment and everything for like 800 bucks. And then, you know, they, the Eagle fours, the newest ones range between a thousand and 2000, depending on how powerful of a machine you want. But that's just like normal computer shopping. You know, it's like, well, do I want the latest and greatest processor? Do I want how much 
RAM do I want? How you know how much? Right, that's going to be the difference in these costs. Is that's basically your exactly. CPU power, memory, and all of this kind of things you want to be able to run. Exactly. So that's you'll the probably want to give a little bit of thought to how what kind of automation you want before you buy one of these. If you don't want to think about it at all, you can get the uh, the top of the line one of about two grand. But the, the, that would be the Eagle Four Pro, I guess. And, and the most other people ones, know they they don't need that. Yeah. If you're not going to be out there watching YouTube while you're imaging and doing all that, <laughs> you know, processing your images right there on that computer is. Yeah, at the I'm, same I'm time, just going like, to say right now, if you're out in the under the stars watching YouTube on this thing, then yeah. stop, just stop mm -hmm. right there. We don't need to be doing that while you're under underneath the stars doing this doing this imaging. <laughs> well, what if they're what if they're watching Tony Darnell on YouTube? Okay, fair enough. If you're watching Deep Astronomy, I take that back. <laughs> I take that back. <laughs> yeah. Quit criticizing your followers. All right. All right. You could do that. But, uh, you know, none of this, none of this neon cats memes or anything out there uh, on this. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but this is, this is pretty important. And now these, these, these Prima Luce products are also sort of, they're not waterproof or anything like that, but they are definitely weather hardened. Mm -hmm. So they can take a more rougher environment than say a lot to your typical laptop can. So that's another real advantage to using something like this on your telescope as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I mean, I've got mine out in the desert in, you know, in the Mojave and that thing, God, those temperature swings are insane. Mm -hmm. It gets yep. so hot. It's so sandy out there. Um, so it's been through the ringer and that thing's been out there a long, very long time and it's still perfect. You know, I still log into it every night. So it's, uh, I can, I can honestly speak to those as being very, very high quality and, uh, they get rid of a lot of the stress, but ultimately when you're thinking about a computer, no matter which way you go, even if you go with a little raspberry Pi box, like the ASI air pro or others that are out there, the stellar mates, I love the stellar mate as well. I think for the price, it's, it's awesome. It's a, the whole box contained can run anything. All of these are, are great options, and there are many of them, so I don't mean to leave them out. Um, and I, I can't think of any that really just don't work. So whatever brand it is that you're interested in, I think they all do a great job. Um, but, uh, you know, the Eagle is certainly the one that's the most complete because it's an actual PC. It's an on-the-go PC that also powers your equipment. So um, yeah, it's that one's sort a of the, really, sort really of the gold great standard of the amateur astronomy control yeah yeah absolutely anyway. well it's just the freedom to be able to no matter what software you want to run you can that's the difference yeah well i want to talk about that now because to me this is the real soul of what you're trying to do you can have all this equipment that can be automated but it's not going to do anything if you don't have software to to control it uh, out, you know, to control all of these things, whether you've got filter wheels, focusers, uh, imagers of different kinds, go-to mounts, all of this stuff has got to be controlled. If you want to have an observing program that's truly automated, what kind of software are people using for this? And is it, is, uh, it, is it freeware? Is it cost money? Both, uh, yeah. both. So the observatories are using programs that cost money. Probably the most popular we see is one called Prism. Um, we see a lot of observatories switching to Prism right now. Um, it is an extremely, extremely complete software. More, It's one of those kind of like Photoshop where you know it just has so many more tools than you will ever in your life need, right? Like it can literally do anything you imagine it can do. It, and if it can't, it's weeks out because they're updating it all the time. It's amazing. Um, this thing will literally find the asteroids in your images and upload them to like asteroid hunting websites for you. Like it will do anything. Um, and run multiple systems at the same time. It's pretty cool, but it costs money. Yeah. And um, I mean, hundreds of dollars money, you know, same thing with SkyX. SkyX is phenomenal. I use SkyX in my uh, observatory. I have a bisque mount there and, and I've had a lot of success with SkyX. I can say that the learning curve with SkyX is pretty steep. Um, it's, it's pretty challenging, but, you know, we've tried to put videos out to make that a little simpler. But it's also, it's an expensive program. I think it might be the most expensive program right now. Um, and it lacks some of the functionality of programs like, um, you know, Prism, just being able to do fully automated runs all night. You need other programs. So like for my observatory, I have to run CCD Autopilot and um, CCD Navigator over the top of it. Um, whereas that, that type of thing is sort of contained just with a different user interface in you know, things like Prism. Okay. So but, let, can I just drill, drill down on that a little yeah, bit? So, so yeah, Prism is your basic, is, is a basic underlying control system. It'll move the telescope. You, I'm sorry, I should say you could program it to move the telescope, see dirt, different objects. It'll handle that bookkeeping, but then you also run on top of that CCD navigator. Did you call it? 
No, Prism doesn't need anything else. Oh, Prism, Prism that's is it. everything it's all contained. Oh, okay. yeah, it is everything contained. Um, the so if you ever see Sky X, I don't, I don't know. I, I know I a lot of our. It, no. Okay, Sky X is a phenomenal program. It's it's probably like if there is something that has been forever known as like the gold standard, I'd say that Sky X is is if it's not that, it's really close. I mean, it's something that a lot of people know and have used forever. A lot of universities. Yeah, around I've seen the, world the advertisements, but that's as far as it's gone. I've not actually used. Um, it. And it comes with their mounts, and their mounts are very popular for good reason. They're phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Um. But, and they're, they're fully capable of automation. I mean, the mounts can handle it. They're great. So uh, the difference is the user, user interface, obviously learning curves, but these are paid programs. And then it goes, you know, down from there, I, you know, you've got other programs that are less expensive, like Maxim DL is less expensive. That's a, another one that's been around for a long time. Um, and then but it lets like you that. control your night of observing, right? It lets you That's script right. yeah. it somehow so that you say, first go look at the Orion Nebula, then go measure this star over here, then go measure something else. You Step by step, but you can program that. Yeah. So okay. certain programs will give you sequencing where you can run full automation like Sequence Generator Pro. Um, it's not something we sell. It's a great program, um, mainly just because it's just direct from their, their website, but it's mm -hmm. phenomenal. And a lot of people use it. But truthfully, what we're seeing more and more is people going to a lot of the freeware stuff because it's free. Mm -hmm. And programs like Nina have become extremely popular. Um, you know, and then the stuff like with the StellarMate, the StellarMate comes with its own software called K Stars. It's phenomenal too. And you can download that, I believe, for free. And it can control everything. So, you know, the freeware obviously doesn't get as much attention as some of the paid programs. So things don't happen quite as quickly, but the ones that are open source, you know, they, it's the idea kind of being, you've got so many people working on it just because they want to see these features included that you get a lot more features added than you would if you only had a handful of engineers because they're paid engineers that are working on specific tasks for profitability reasons on paid software. So the freeware is pretty good, man. I mean, I, I like it. And so for the, for the low, low cost of free stuff to beat, and a lot of people start there. So I would say for people looking to get into it, maybe check out some of the stuff that's free out there. And, you know, planetary imaging has, um, uh, Registax and, and, um, God, what's the other one? Not sharp cap. Although sharp caps a pretty popular program as well. Um, fire captures another planetary imaging one. You know, I always tell people to start with Nebulosity because it comes with, you know, um, it has a free trial. It's only 99 bucks and it can control your your camera and do the processing in the software. Oh, that's, but these are, that's yeah. an important distinction. We should mention that. So what I've been talking about up to now has been the software that automates the data acquisition that moves the telescope, finds the object, focuses and then sets exposure times and, and downloads images onto a hard disk. That's yeah. one layer of automation. And that is a truly automated telescope. But there, mm -hmm. there is another layer here that, we're, that you just brought up, which is processing. So you've got all this raw data sitting on a hard drive. You can now also automatically gather those images and process them too. And that's what this other software does, right? Yes. Um, and... I mean, you think about it, like processing is really half of the equation. So you can't just say that it's like, well, I'm just going to get automated software for this one part of it. Like if you can't process your data, the data is going to be kind of useless. Right. But uh, coming from my area where I where I'm used to working, that was the way it was brought up or broken up in, in the professional realm. You automate getting your data and then you're given all this raw data. It's on you. I had to go take all this raw data and then process it myself, writing software that I, you know, I had to write, but the, so that's why I'm not used to that part of it. But I guess nowadays, if you've just got, you know, a 200 stack or 200 uh, images of the Orion Nebula that you want to register and stack on top of each other and then do some scaling on that can all be uh, automated as well. Right. What I don't like about that though, is I don't, that seems to be where you need to be present right, is in the processing. Don't you agree? I mean, can you really do a good job automatically processing data? I've seen scripts that do processing and they're they're decent, but it's never going to compare to somebody that takes the time to go through 
and really process their own image. It, I mean, it's not even close to, you know, I haven't seen APODs one, I should say, oh, that's right. with an automatic script. <laughs> I've never and I've seen watched that your happen. streams where you're actually spending time doing, you're, you're doing this manually. Mm-hmm. You're not scripting it. You're like, okay, no, let's, let's, let's pull this up more. Because there's, there's a, you know, there's a learning curve to processing, but I've got videos that I've done on, on YouTube, on OPT telescopes, YouTube page, where literally from start to finish from a, blank image to a fully processed image in 10 minutes, if that, mm-hmm. you know, and a lot of my images that I post, I mean, they five minutes, seven minutes of processing total. Like I don't spend a lot of time on it. A lot of people do. People spend days, some people spend weeks processing a single image, you know, and that's great. If that's your thing, like by all means, it's part of the hobby. It's a great part of the hobby. And it's certainly one of the artistic parts of the hobby. Um, so I think it's great, but yeah, it's processing is its own little thing. And you, Definitely need software that can do it. Most people, I'd say, still probably use Photoshop or PixInsight. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of stuff out there. You don't just have to use those. Astro Pixel Processor is another one that's phenomenal. So there's a lot yeah, of stuff Yeah, I can out see there. some part of it being totally automated. Like I could totally get, like I would want as part of my automated observing run for the night to be not only the list of objects I want imaged and there and the, the exposure times I wanted and all of this stuff, but I, and the number of exposures to take, but I'd also want them to take corresponding darks and flats and, and then go ahead and do that. Okay. Just subtract the darks, divide by the flats, get, get that out of my way so that all I have now are, you know, Master level files. one processed images. Now I've, I've got all the calibrated yeah. stuff out of my way. Now I can play with these, stack them, maybe stack them, I guess. So that would be another automated part. And then, and then after that, I want to take it and do all the stretching and the color enhancement and the, the scaling of it and all of that kind of stuff myself. But, um, yeah. you know, to, to each person yeah, their own can, as far as how that goes. Exactly. And you've got people, you've got different schools of thought on both sides of it. Um, you know, I agree with you. I, I like, showing up at the point that I've got master files where I'm just Mm going to make it look the way I want it. But a lot of people really, if you're, if you're a pixel peeper where you're going to look at the finest details of that image, um, which those are always my favorite imagers or my favorite images, the people that really do take the time to do that. Um, Although it's not me, (laughs) I wouldn't (laughs) do that. Um, The people that do that though, they always have these phenomenal images and those people want to calibrate their images themselves to really make sure they get the absolute best calibration. And, um, you know, they'll check every single dark file. They'll check every flat frame to make sure there's nothing wrong with anything before they do that. And so that, you know, obviously they don't want to automate, but yeah, I, I agree with you. You can, and you can do it simple or you can, you can do this any way you want is what I should say. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, uh, you want to, it's all the pain in the butt stuff. That's what you want to get rid of. And that's what we're, that's what automation is all about so that you can enjoy the things that you're there to, to, to do. The, the, the only, the only thing I could see this being problematic with, with a lot of uh, pre-processing is you want to make sure that if you're after data, like for example, if you're hunting asteroids or doing exoplanet light curves, transit light curves, those sorts of things are data intensive. You want to make damn sure that whatever you're, whatever you're processing is calibrated uh, with units in the, in the pixels, but that's a different level. And it may, and most people who are after pretty pictures don't care about that and have a lot more, more leeway that way. Mm -hmm. But with data, with, with, with actual science, you want to be a lot more careful with that. Right. All right. So a couple of the things you can, you can, uh, automate uh and it, so we've talked about go-to mounts we've talked about uh focusers imaging uh s- computers and software all of that you've got one hell of a system if you're this far but what it, but there's a couple other things we're not done if you wanted to you could add a filter wheel to this what the hell what a filter will give you dustin <laughs> yeah what do you what, what do you need what are the, what are, what's out there as far as filter wheels you know what's funny is that this used to be a question only associated with monochrome cameras um, now it's people are buying filter wheels with both color and mono, but let's talk about mono. Cause that's where you still see everybody that has a monochrome camera is going to have a filter wheel as well for the most part. Yeah. So, uh, with a monochrome camera, obviously it's exactly that. So it doesn't detect color. It just detects whether or not photons hit each photo site, each, uh, pixel. Right. And so the filters allow you to determine which color light passes through so that when you're trying to combine your images in the end, you can say you can get the color image appropriately. Um, Because obviously, if you just said, let me collect all the red, green and blue light with a sensor whose capability couldn't determine which was which, you would just have a black and white image. All of that light would hit and it'd be very bright, 
but you'd have a black and white image. So what you do instead is you take a red filter and then you cut out all the green and the blue. And then, you know, in the end, all of the light that I see right here in this, this frame is just red. Then if you do the same with blue and then the same with green, then when you stack those all on top of each other, now you have a full color image, red, green, and blue combined. And you'll have a color image that is, you know, perfect representation of where that light is. Um, that's the idea. And that, so, the, the advantage to that over the other kind is that you get the most photons possible this way in those significantly wavelengths. more than a color camera, like 80% plus more than a color camera. It's, it's crazy. Um, at minimum, if you had a hundred percent quantum efficiency, you'd still get 75% more. So, um, it's really, really good. The reason being, you know, with a color camera, if your color pattern in your Bayer matrix that makes it a color camera is red, green, green, blue, then by definition, all of the hydrogen that you're going to get out there, all the red that's in space can only ever reach 25% of your pixels. The green, green, blue are all going to reject it. So you, you know, by definition can only actually capture if you have hundred percent quantum efficiency. 25% of the light, not to speak of the light being rejected, you know, by each of the color filters otherwise, right? That's just the light that actually found its way to a red pixel. That's right. So, you know, not, and it's not like those light, the light, the photons coming in and be like, oh man, I'm going to shift. I see a red one over there. I'm going to aim for that. Like, no, it's just going to bounce off the wrong stuff. That's right. And so, and so, yeah, you put a red filter in your in your path, all of the pixels are going to get that red light and you'll get all of the flux that your cave, that your image or that your imaging system is capable of gathering. And then you can then take them and add them all up later and get the colors that you ordinarily would have gotten for a color camera. Way better Literally system. only, only uh, limited by reflection, which is almost non-existent. The transmission on these filters are so good, so good. Um, so only limited by reflection and uh, quantum efficiency, which is the sensor's ability, each photo site's ability to actually capture the photon or register the photon that hit the photo site, convert that to, you know, an electron. So, um, yeah, it's... Uh, it's really monochrome cameras are magic. They're amazing, but you got to have filters. And uh, so, what do you what do you like as far as filter wheels that are automatable? Yeah. So a filter wheel for anyone that that hasn't imaged is just literally that. It's a wheel where all of those filters are inside of it next to each other, and then that wheel can either be manual where you turn it with your hand or motorized, which is where the automation comes in where you can click in the software, go to green. You hear that motor turn on, you hear the wheels clicking as they move by or the filters clicking as they move by. And then it stops and it puts that green filter right in front of the sensor and it holds it there until you say, go to hydrogen or go to, you know, blue. And then you hear it move. And that's what the wheel does is it just moves the correct filter in front of the sensor while you're imaging that color. Um, and the software is smart enough to register it as whatever color you selected. So if you select green, then in the end, all of your files are say like, this was green image of, you know, M42, uh, which is awesome. So it, it organizes all of that for you and really automates that process. But uh, filter wheels, you know, most camera brands make a filter wheel that you can also use with whatever camera it is that you selected. So if you buy a QHY camera, you can get uh, the associated QHY filter wheel. So certain cameras, okay. as, as the sensor gets bigger, you have to have a bigger opening for a bigger filter as well. So there's a specific filter wheel that will go to each type of camera, if that makes sense. You know, yeah. you don't want to put, you don't want to put a filter that's smaller than your sensor. Or you're going to be blocking all that light. And why have that big sensor if you can't catch light with it? Yeah. You'll just so, get it all vignetted and cut right out you, if you put the exactly. small filter wheel in. Yeah. So you want to get those, but there are, I mean, ZWO makes them, Starlight Express makes them, and these are all phenomenal. Um, I mean, just about all camera brands. Actually, I think all camera brands do make their own filter wheels. Do their filter wheels come with filters or that, is, that an, is that an extra expense? Uh, sometimes they sell them as packages, but it's always an extra expense. Even if it is a package, yeah. it's going to, you know, it's going to be higher than what it is if you just buy the filter wheel separately. Yeah. And this most, is one of those things you want to think about what kind of imaging you want to do before you go spend the money on these. If you're, if you're, and you want to look at a couple of factors, not only the wavelengths that, that they're centered on, but their band passes as well. Typically filters with narrower band passes. In other words, a very narrow amount of, uh, of, uh, Free, uh, of the wavelengths are, are allowed through the filter uh, tend to be much more expensive than broad filters that let most, you know, 
of the surrounding light at that central peak in. So you yeah. want to think about the kind of imaging that you're going to be doing um, as well. So, and I, yeah, I guess in the but, one, you, you I just want to look at good I, filters though, too, man. I mean, don't put yeah. bad glass in front of good, you know, <laughs> you're wasting good your sensors. Money. It's a bad, yeah. yeah, exactly. It will become the limiting factor of your imaging and you'll get reflections and like bloated stars and all this craziness on it. You don't want to put bad filters in front of good sensors because it will capture all those mistakes. Um, so, you know, the ones that come with sensors are usually a good place to start for people, but almost everybody ultimately upgrades to the premium brands of filters in the end because, because of exactly what I'm describing, you know? And I, I think that, you know, probably the most popular brand is also one of the most expensive, which is Chroma because it's just filters last forever. They're not mechanical. They don't, or they're not, uh, you know, electric. They don't go bad as long as you're not scratching them and stuff. Those things last forever. So people just end up buying really high end filters and they just use them with whatever system they go with. Yeah. That's the beauty of optics. Once you've got a good set, you're it's, it's yeah. like an heirloom. You'll pass it down yeah. to generations. Right. It'll still be working exactly. every bit. Telescope, as good as it same did. way. Yeah. You can feel good about buying a really high end Teleview, you know, refractor because you'll be passing that thing down for generations and it'll be just as good three generations from now as it was for you. Those That's things right. are just phenomenal. Yeah. And you look at old Zeiss glass now, like those really old telescopes they made, man, they're still epic. Yeah. Yeah. They don't, they don't wear out and, and maybe, maybe coatings might need to be changed over time, but that's rare. And, uh, you know, I mean, I remember when they were decommissioning some of those huge 10 inch, 20 inch refractors that used to be built by Alvin Clark. Um, and, and, you know, big deal back in the early 20th century, they were decommissioning these telescopes. Well, the glass is still every bit as useful as it ever was, or they were very long focal length, but when you're looking at a 20 inch piece of refractive glass, um, it worked every bit as good as the day it was made. And, uh, it's there's amazing. no reason to not reuse it in something else. So, yeah. Um, yeah. It's I mean, we have a telescope in in the office, you know, OPT was started uh, in 1947, and we have a telescope made the year it was handmade the year that OPT started, and it's still in the office now. And when you look at the coatings on that telescope, that reflector, it still looks beautiful, man. It's a gorgeous <laughs> working telescope. Yeah. And it's like, you think about how old that is. And it's like, yeah. wow, man, this thing, damn near 75 years old. Look at it. Still, I'd be proud to let somebody look through it, you know? Sure. It's absolutely. I remember the same way I had a, a 10 inch, uh, a cave Astrola from the sixties, uh, when I was in high school that we got to use, uh, and, and, and later on in life, I was able to look through it again. Beautiful, pristine images. Absolutely. Whatever happened telescope. to those, man? Whatever happened to Cave? I don't know. They just, I think they just, I think I asked somebody once, I think they might still be around, but I think it's, it's like a nostalgia uh, company, you know, where I think somebody may Is still it? have the trademark to the company, but I don't think anybody's making, I don't think they're making anything. Yeah. I, I haven't seen any come through even our used department in forever. And, uh, you know, OPT, the old building, when it was down by the, the ocean, um, what three or four has that been four years ago um yeah that's, it that's had about a huge I'm, huge I cave telescope moving. yeah 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 it had a huge cave telescope on the roof so everybody driving by could see this telescope up there um but that's the last one i've seen man yeah yeah and i often wonder the same thing about questar questar used to be a big deal in the 80s and uh, i don't know where they went they the, but they used to be like the the top of the line telescope back in the day yeah we still um, see those pretty regularly actually yeah we still see people still that them. love people that love questar love questar <laughs> yeah yeah that was uh they were they were the big thing back in the 80s that's all i remember well, yeah. uh, so getting back to filters, let me just point out that most filters are made in specific sizes and filter wheels, I think, will accommodate those filter sizes. So when you pick a camera first, then you'll probably get the associated filter wheel that goes with that camera. But then the filters you buy, well, they, they will accommodate certain filter sizes and you'll be able to buy the right ones to go in there and, and using all the characteristics we just talked about. So yeah, it's worth so doing. For for filters, people should look at, um, there's, there's sizes that are going to be confusing. And I, I want to make sure that I can maybe clarify this right now. Sure. That you'll see different sizes. It'll be inch and a quarter. You'll see 36 millimeter. And then you'll see these that are like everywhere, which are 48 millimeter. And then one that says two inch. And if you look at the 48 millimeter or 50 millimeter round um, and two inch, so you're like, well, isn't that the same thing? <laughs> like, right. 50 millimeter and two. Inch. <laughs> like, but what... 
what it's saying when it says anything that says inch on it is mounted. So it has a metal ring about around it to where filter wheels that accept threaded filters, those can actually thread in. Whereas the ones that just say millimeters are not. So like inch and a quarter, because it says inch, is going to have a mounting to where you could thread it in and it just locks in. The other ones are just pieces of glass with no metal around them and you have to set them in and then um, use little washers, like these little plastic washers that hold it in and keep it from falling out. But what that does is it gives you the, you know, the full diameter of the filter to um, collect light through, whereas the, the mountings are just really convenient. But that's the difference when you see those sizes and, um, you know, and they look to be the same. The ones that say inches have mountings. Um, oh, that's good and, to know. And you'll know, it, it'll tell you, your filter will be clear about which ones it accepts, right? But you need to make sure that you get the right one for whatever filter wheel it is you choose and make yeah. sure that it can support the sensor size that you get. So like an inch and a quarter filter will only support very small crop sensor uh, sensors, whereas like full frame, uh, you know, th 35 millimeter format, which is what's so popular anymore. I mean, just about everybody's making full frame cameras, which is crazy to think about. It was yeah, so expensive, <laughs> even five years ago. And now everybody owns a full frame camera. That used to be $15,000. Now people are getting them for a grand, two grand. Um, but full frame requires two inch or larger. Okay. So you can't, you can't use those small filters. Don't get 36 millimeter. Don't get inch and a quarter. They, they will not work with your full frame without just severely blocking the light. Yeah, and that's wastes your money on your full frame camera if you do that. So, but that's one of those things where it's probably better to just call somebody like OPD and say, "Hey, I'm, I got this camera. I want a filter wheel for it. What should I get?" Uh, you know, and and they can step you through that process if you're a little bit confused about all of that. But uh, yeah. Um, so, the, but filter wheels are important, especially if you're doing any kind of photometry or uh, color work with a with a uh, grayscale camera like a CCD instead of a full a color camera that has some of the CMOS detectors in it. So, yeah, um, most people are just getting two inch filters anymore, like two inch or fifty millimeter yeah. round, and they're just buying them bigger, even if they have a crop sensor, because then you have room to upgrade. And like I was saying earlier, you don't have to buy the filters twice. Once you have really good filters, just use them on everything. So if you just buy that one wheel and you get multiple different cameras or whatever, you can just keep them in that wheel and put the wheel on different cameras and be fine. But if you buy crop, it's not going to work if you get a full frame sensor down the road. Right. Okay. And so, uh, and my final question on the whole filter wheel thing is how, what's the typical range of filters they can hold? How many can they hold? Uh, they go up to, I've seen filter wheels that hold 11. Oh, wow. That like many. That's something, oh, okay. that's something you would have, man. Every yeah. single science filter on earth <laughs> in a single filter wheel. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we shoot no. nitrogen and potassium. Yeah. Um, yeah, but well, that's, that's, yeah. So so eleven. That's a lot. Wow. That's that's. Yeah, okay. uh, there there are some filter wheels that are nine, some that are eleven. The most popular sizes are five and seven. I always use seven um, because I do LRGB for color, so luminance, which is all the colors for brightness, and then red, green, and blue separately, so that I can get a color image. And then I do narrow band, which is hydrogen alpha, sulfur, and um, oxygen. And, you know, I can shoot all three of those for my narrowband images. And that's seven filters, LRGB, HA, S203. Yeah. Right. And I guess it is important to have the luminance band. That's just no filter. <laughs> so you can have uh, an open space too. Well, so. it just filters out UV and IR. So oh, that you don't get, oh, I see. Yeah. You don't get the bloat on the stars from it. But yeah, other than that, it would just be, why don't you just leave the filter out, you know? Okay. Well, before we close out this podcast, so we've got, we've, you've, we've given you the basics of what you, of what you're going to need to build your own uh, automated setup at home where you can just turn it on, do some programming, enter in some scripts and hopefully get some data out at the end of the, in the end of the whole thing. You could go a lot further with this. You get sky sensors, sky brightness, things, all kinds of stuff to go with it. But what we've talked about is kind of a, a good starter point, uh, from starter up to advanced uh, for getting going on an automated system. But let's say you're brand new to all of this. You don't know anything about anything and you still want an automated system. There's still a couple of options for you. Now we've talked about these two telescopes and Dustin's even mentioned it earlier in the podcast between the uh, Stellina um, uh, put out by Bayonis and also the uh, EV scope put out by Unistellar. These are telescopes uh, 
that Dustin and I have described as being game changers for getting into the hobby. I still stand by this. I, I've taken flag for it. I know you have too, Dustin. But I think mm-hmm. these telescopes are the future of amateur astronomy in a lot of ways. In a box that you just open up and start using, you get most of what we've already told you about. Okay, as far as automation, uh, you simply set it up. On, I think you have to have a level surface and you put it up on a level surface and you turn it on and the telescopes will go through their, their motions to get you ready for a night of observing. Um, and so they are plug and play solutions uh, for most beginners and, and many you know advanced amateurs, I enjoyed using both of these telescopes myself, and I consider myself an advanced amateur. So um, you know, I I don't. My only question would be um, some of the some of the choices they made with uh, regard to optics and all of that kind of stuff. But otherwise, it was a pretty good experience. What do you think, Dustin? Do you do you think that as a beginner automated telescope, those are pretty good? And and would you say they're a, a decent value? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, look, I'm I'm the opposite of what uh, you know. What a lot of the man um, traditionalists, I'd say, maybe that's the right word. I don't know. But the harumphers. You know, the, <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for the euphemism. Um, but yeah, it. I don't think that you have to go out and enjoy the hobby and, and try to enjoy the hobby the way that other people have, just because they took a certain path to enjoyment in it, it's a hobby. And so if what you think is fun is building the best damn observatory in the world and learning on that, great, go do it. Mm -hmm. And if you think it's fun to just go out with binoculars, do it. The whole point is that you're enjoying it and, um, you know, just kind of getting out under the night sky. So if automation and convenience are something that's important to you, then you're certainly going to be buying above a frustration curve because you know, people that get telescopes that are really, really challenging, like you see a lot of people get their first telescope that's an equatorial mount that Mm -hmm. doesn't have motors and has little hand cranks. I would struggle with that today. (laughs) They are, they are rough. Telescopes all over the world, man. And I'm telling you, I would struggle. I would not (laughs) understand how to turn these little hand cranks so some oh, of I'd be turning the deck knob when the RA one needs to be turned. I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I've done that. They're so <laughs> challenging. And I'm saying like you, you can get those things and really go out there and you're right. You're going to learn a lot. Um, and maybe you'll be able to tell other people that they need to go out and do it the hard way. But you know, the truth is, man, like just do whatever's going to be fun for you. I'm, I like convenience. So go to tracking that kind of stuff I think makes the hobby more fun. Being able to just type in like, hey, go to Saturn. Watching the telescope move for me, watching the telescopes for me move is like half the enjoyment. Yeah. I love every time that thing takes off and it goes and finds something in the night sky. It like gives you chills watching it, man. Yeah. I love it. So I think you just got to do whatever part you enjoy. And those Stellina and EV scopes, that, that smart stuff that you're talking about, the full automation, like, man, setting that thing down, turning your cell phone on. And then literally just watching it map out the night sky, know where it's at. And then you say, I want to see objects all night long. You can sit there and look at everything in the night sky. I'm blown away by that every single time. I think yeah. people can absolutely enjoy the hobby that way. Yeah. And and like I said, I've enjoyed my experience with both of them. But on the subject of automation, I don't know that you can do some of the things we've been talking about. Like, I'm not sure you can script these things. Once they're turned on and observing, I don't know that you can say, go through all of these objects and give me the data. Do you know if you can? I know that uh, Stalina was talking about that at one point. And I I heard from one of our staff, actually, that they said, man, I hope hope it's them that was saying this, but that it would be a feature eventually. But Mm -hmm. that's just, I don't know that for sure. So maybe So so don't expect that, I guess, is my point. You won't, some of the stuff we've talked about, you won't be able to do with these. Yeah. I know that it's possible because obviously it's just, it's literally one update away. It's software. Yeah. It's just it, software. Yeah. You can, those, that's the beauty of scopes like that is they literally get better as they age because the updates come out. Yeah. When I got this, the EV scope, it was a really rough, uh, rough first copy of the software. And um, I struggled to use it and I set it up and, and then they sent me an updated app and mm-hmm. it was like a different telescope altogether. Nothing oh, changed so with my amazing. hardware or any of that, but I suddenly had a better I telescope. Agree. At, with the, I did the same thing. Software. 
I was so really I, frustrated the first time I used it. I yeah. didn't understand it. It didn't it didn't work the way. But they said that. They said, hey, we got a lot of bugs to work out. We just want to see, get a first impression. And I, I told them, I was like, I was really frustrated by this. And then mm-hmm. by the next time I used it, it was like, damn, this is a different monster. This thing is incredible. You know, but that's the beauty of these smart telescopes is that as you own them, they literally get better than the day you bought it. Yeah. And what I would hope you could do I don't know if you can, but it would be great as because I'm a software engineer, it would be awesome to be able to write my own app for this and say, you know what, I love what you've done, but I want this telescope to do all of these scripting things that it can't do right now. And maybe they would that there's a market for that. I don't know that you can do it, but it would be something that I would look into if if I were going to be into this more yeah. hardcore. But like I said, you could, or you could, you know, be maybe wait for software updates. But that's the thing you get with these telescopes. Yes, you're paying more up front, but you're getting sensors, you're getting filter wheels, you're getting, you're getting uh, defocusers, or I'm sorry, focusers, uh, derotators, all kinds of things that need to be automated individually uh, in the box already. Now it's just software. Now it's about the experience of interacting with an app to get what you need out of it. So that's something you should consider. If you don't have any equipment, then the EV scope and the um, Selena are something I would look pretty hard at. So, so um, a little off topic here, but I promised um, Instagram that I would, I would answer this on the next podcast. Uh, so before we break here, cause I know we're, we're about to hit our hour, man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, go ahead. But I've got the shirt coming to you. Actually, you might already have it. Has it already reached you? The, uh, the radiant, the new radiant shirt. No, man, I, I love the old Radiant shirt. Did you make it better? Yeah, we, well, we got the new one. You know, when we released the Raptor, we, we, um, it's just like being an astronomer is just like a really cool thing. It's such an, an awesome, <laughs> you know, it's like, it is. I don't know. It, it becomes part of who you are. It's definitely like an identity type hobby because it gets in your blood, man. You just mm-hmm. like, you, you go outside and you look at the sky differently. You look at the world around you differently. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, when when Trevor and I were talking through the details of the Radiant Raptor, we decided to make the black, the whole open box experience. Everything is black. Everything. Even the bubble wrap inside is black. Everything. So when you wow. open this thing up, you know, you've got this black bag covered in black bubble wrap and the box itself is black with black writing on the box. The black logo that says, for those who collect light in the dark. <laughs> right. And. Uh, it's just huge across the box, and I, I can't love tell that you. Man, tagline. That's an awesome. Who thought that up? That was really good. Was that yours? I I don't remember. I remember we were on the phone. I was standing outside of OPT, and we were talking, and I I don't remember exactly how it went down. Um, those who collect light in the dark. I love that. That is so. Great. I just remember both of us just being like, "Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's that's the one," because um, that's that pretty much sums it up. That's who we are as a group. Most definitely, you know, and um, and so it's on the box, but. You know, people started posting this box, you know, as much as we were seeing pictures of the telescope on social media, they were posting this pictures of the top of their box that black on black on black on black. And um, that for those who collect light in the dark box, and then I started getting flooded with emails. People are like, hey, can you make me a shirt that says this? This is really cool. Definitely. And so we just released that shirt on our website. Um, that's just a black shirt. With black writing and a black logo, it says for those who collect light in the dark. And I know they they already got one of those out to you. So, oh, good! I um, can't wait. I was hoping you don't. Know. Don't let me down here. I want that one. I yeah. want one of those. Yeah, That's it's awesome. pretty cool, man. But you can see it. <laughs> you can see it on our uh, on our website there. And okay. um, we're we're putting all kinds of stuff up this week. We got like uh, sweatshirts and hats and all kinds of cool stuff that's going up there, man. But um, yes, as promised, these shirts yeah. are now live and. Um, they're they're ready to go so awesome it's basically our our reading raptor box on a t-shirt <laughs> amazing well that's awesome I, I love that whoever whoever came up with that tagline congrats that was that's a real that's a really good one i'm not easily impressed by stuff like that and that impressed yeah me, so <laughs> yeah i don't i don't remember exactly but let's let's say let's give trevor credit he's smarter than i am it was probably trevor good work you know? trevor. good work, yeah trevor. good work man good work. <laughs> all right <laughs> all right so is there anything else you wanted to do uh no man i think okay. this was fun it's fun cool yeah thanks man thanks for joining me talking about automation uh and uh we will uh I, this will be not only posted in, in audio form but also on video form so we hope you check it out on video as well and on behalf of dustin gibson my name is tony darnell thank you all so very much for watching and listening and as always keep looking up
Space Junk is produced by Deep Astronomy and sponsored by OPT Telescopes in Carlsbad, California. Please visit our website at spacejunkpodcast.com. Also, please send any questions and comments or ideas for new episodes.